David, if, if I start with you, the focus, I imagine, will be on this price hike uh, the, and what it means going forward as opposed to any past quarter's numbers. That's right. And I think this price hike represents the key dilemma here for Netflix. They got to raise the price in order to keep from running out of money and keep the bondholders happy. And every time they raise their prices, it makes their competitors more viable. So it's a catch-22 for a business model that, when you look at the fundamentals, really just doesn't work. I mean, that's a pretty negative take. You could also say that they're raising prices because they actually have pricing power and they're growing so fast that they're able to pass along higher prices because consumers have an insatiable appetite for their content. You know, Sarah, that's right. I mean, you, you can make that argument, but what we have to look at is what does the stock price plot imply in terms of valuation? And when you run the numbers to justify 350 bucks, that means they're going to have, that means the market believes they're going to have 500 million customers paying about 20 bucks a month, right? You can, you can massage those numbers around a little bit differently, but at 20 bucks a month, right, do you really believe that they're going to have such a monopolistic share of the market that, you know, forces out Disney and Hulu and all these other folks? It's just an unrealistic set of expectations for future cash flows baked into the stock. But, you know, not many people pay attention to cash flow, so it really hasn't mattered. <laughs> Indeed, uh, most people focus on the subscriber growth. Tom, is that what you'll be looking out for tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the name of the game with Netflix is always subscriber growth. So if they can show in the fourth quarter a significant uptick and also their projections for the year, which, I mean, uh, as you're referring to, that's really the big question. When they're raising their prices as substantially as they are, uh, if they can still show you know, ample growth for over the course of the year in a way that pleases Wall Street, then I think they can really start justifying that valuation. And you can start to see at least a little bit, pull, a little bit, a little bit of a pullback on uh, their cash burn, which is significant. And I do pay attention to that. It is, uh, it is something people have been watching very closely. I mean, you know, I have to agree with almost both sides here, but it seems to me the market is taking uh, from this decision on pricing that subscriber growth numbers are probably fine. Netflix is always a huge mover on earnings, right? And it could swing either way because right now I think you have the street pretty comfortable with what it looks like. Um, and, and so, in other words, this is under the old pricing regime. We don't really know if the subscriber uh, trends are going to stay this way. But to me, it's, it's flexing muscles and saying before the competitors flood the market, we're going to kind of lay our claim on more of the streaming dollars out there. Tom, does it all still rest on, on uh, their unique uh, Netflix original content and how does the slate look for the year ahead as to whether it's likely to drive that subscriber growth or not? Yeah, I mean, it rests on it more and more. We're going to be entering a very new era for Netflix where a lot of their big suppliers of content like Disney, like potentially Warner Media, uh, will be pulling back on their content from the platform. And it's going to take some time. It's not going to be an immediate impact. But you've been seeing Netflix very substantially increasing the amount of original content they have on there. Uh, but there are still big question marks. Uh, there was the whole story around Friends earlier this year and whether or not they were going to re-up their deal to continue with Friends. The Office is another huge performer on Netflix. And, you know, really to, uh, to be determined whether NBC Universal, when they roll out their streaming platform, whether they'd want to make Friends, uh, excuse me, whether they'd want to make The Office exclusive to their platform. These are all things that have hugely built up Netflix subscribers base in the past. And uh, you're going to start seeing their original content becoming central to their consumer appeal. David, I didn't want to let pass your, your, your kind of calculation of what uh, the, the market cap currently implies. You said 500 million subs paying 20 a month. So you think this right now, this company needs $10 billion a month in revenue in order to make the valuation work today? That's right. That's what the valuation implies. And this is a reverse DCF. It's a $150 billion market cap right now. That's, that's if, you re, if you run it through a DCF, and we've got this model on our website, you can see it, just run the numbers. That's what you got to do to justify 350 bucks a share. Uh, and, and that's kind of where the valuation's always been. So look, you know, people aren't usually looking at, at this stock through that lens because it's a whole lot harder to sell the stock or sell the bonds, which is what Wall Street's doing, right? Uh, and so our, our take's unique, but it's comprehensive, it's mathematical, uh, and it, it is what it is. And that's why people want to focus on subscriber growth. Let's not worry about cash flow. They spent 10 billion, they've lost $10 billion in cash flow over the last five years. I think they burned something like three billion in the first three quarters of, of last year. Uh, and so replacing the content that they may be losing with new content, it's a very expensive endeavor. And that's why so they, they've got to grow the way they got to grow to justify the price. You mentioned that this, the higher prices opens the door further for competition. 
who are you betting on? Do you have a pick with, within the sector that you like their streaming anti-Netflix strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think Disney is a, is a much better business. They've got higher margins. They've got much better cash flow, great returns on capital. They've got the ability to merchandise, which is another way to monetize content in a way that Netflix does not have. Look, you know, when you think about the competitive position of Netflix, what is it? Oh, they distribute content online. What's defensible about that, right? And Disney's got a much better track record as well in terms of creating, successfully creating original content. Not many firms have. You can count on one hand the number of firms that have over time successfully monetized original content. It's an expensive, difficult proposition. Disney's done it. And part of the reason they've done it is because they've got better ways of monetizing. So they've got big competitive advantages versus Netflix, which again, at the end of, at the, end of the day, it's a one-trick pony. Pony. It's like the, the, AOL, the, the AOL of TTM. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, there's really nothing there except you know, this growing subscriber base, this great valuation, analysts on Wall Street focusing on numbers that Netflix can show going up, while everybody just kind of turns a blind eye to the cash flows and the expectations baked into the stock price.